All right, thank you for joining for another episode of the Nebraska Gentleman. Today we have a special guest. He is a big part of my life and where I'm at today. When we, I met him in 2015 um, during a visit at Springfield College, and he really welcomed me with open arms and influenced me uh, to work with athletes and obviously the general population. He's been at Texas A&M University ever since as a program co direct coordinator. And he's been doing a lot, a lot of great work, which I can't wait for him to share more of here in a little bit. His name is the Mr. Omar Figueroa. Omar, how you doing, man? Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for the warm welcome. Of course, of course. So I'm going to jump right into it because I also excited to learn everything that you're doing, or at least hear it again. So Omar, why performance consulting? And can you share what all it is that you're doing right now? Yes, yes. Uh, so for me, Right now, I'm in a very unique position because I'm at Texas A&M University where I have the privilege of consulting with the varsity teams, but at the same time, I'm a program coordinator for the university where I have the privilege of creating programs for the university. Right now, I'm overseeing the Explore program, which helps students and student athletes on campus explore their strengths, their weaknesses, and mission in life. And then I have also have the privilege of being a performance consultant for Premier Sports Psychology, which majority of my focus there goes towards consulting with the Minnesota Twins, uh, developing programming from book clubs to mindfulness to individual to team consultations. Uh, and on top of that, I'm also consulting with, with professional soccer players in, in Mexico, in the MLS, USL, NISA, Liga MX specifically. Uh, that those are the three primary projects that are that are that I'm most of my attention right now. And the reason why I perform as consulting is because I love sports and I love psychology. It's the perfect combination of performance. And this feels so interesting. You could really put performance consulting into any domain or channel, it's completely transferable. So when I wanted to pick a field, I wanted to pick a field that was easily malleable into many different sectors of life. And it get, really gives me the opportunity to be very fluid all the way from businesses that I'm overseeing to the consulting that I do with professional and student athletes. Yeah, you're one of the busiest uh, men I know. And you know, Omar, I, I love that piece when you mentioned it is very transferable and we're seeing that too with the academic side that you're doing at TAM, uh, TAMU or Texas a and University. So Omar, can you share what skills you feel you have instilled that have led you to this much success as a performance consultant? Honestly, everything started as a kid when I was young and my father took me to a soccer field and he told me, you you're, might not be naturally gifted, but you can really put a lot of effort and time into this and you might get somewhere. So I wasn't a gifted soccer player, but I did feel that if I worked hard, I would at least get around the corner in my career. And I had the privilege of playing abroad and playing college ball. So I, I was very fortunate that not my talent, but my work ethic got me there. So I, I'm 100% certain that when I wake up every single morning before 5 a.m. to read and to get ahead on my day and to, to have meetings early in the morning and to understand what's going on in the world, not just in the sports psych world, but just in the world in general, because it's going to help you make better decisions. It all stems from that work ethic. Omar, can you share where you're from and then just any experiences growing up that you face that you believe were based maybe on your the color of your skin? Yeah, no, dude. Honestly, bro, it was, I was born in Patterson, New Jersey, and in the suburbs of, of New York City. So we were 25 to 30 minutes outside of the city. I remember growing up, it just a primary African American and Latino community in Patterson, New Jersey. If you don't know Patterson, New Jersey, you might know it from Lean On Me with Morgan Friedman. Uh, that's Patterson, New Jersey. That's Eastside, Eastside High School. Down the, I used to live down the street from there. So we, we grew up in quote unquote, what would you say in the hood? It was, it was, it wasn't, I didn't know I was living in the hood though, because it was so beautiful for me back then. And even when I go back home or when I go visit my family in New Jersey, I feel so comfortable there. So I had the privilege of living in Patterson, New Jersey. And then when I was 10, 10 and a half, 11, my family moved to, to South Florida, 
where I spent the rest of my teenage years before I left home at 18. There were many experiences, honestly, that I had growing up that I can recall. But the, the one that, that, based on what, everything that's going on, I honestly haven't shared this with many people just because we don't talk about it. When I was 18 years old in high school, we were at a party, uh, two of my friends, Black, African-American friends, and my brother and myself, which there was four of us in a car and, and we were coming back from a high school party and we got stopped on our way home. We were literally two blocks away from our house and we get stopped on a routine stop at 11 o'clock at night. We're the only car in the street. And the cop, of course, approaches the car, says, you know, put your hands where I can see them. We were compliant and the cop then requested for license and registration uh, my friend, Courtney Hall, who now lives in Seattle, was looking for the license registration because it was his mother's car at 18 years old. <laughs> no one had a car <laughs> during that time. I didn't have a car until 25. So it was, uh, you know, we don't know what the license registration is. So he's looking for license registration. And, and Courtney told me, hey, open the glove compartment. I opened the glove compartment. And the officer automatically takes out his gun and he says, put your fucking hands up where I can see them. I'm sorry, I didn't want to curse, but that's exactly what he said. And, and I literally dropped my hands and all we said was, don't shoot, please don't shoot, please don't shoot, please don't shoot. And you can tell that the officer was, was alarmed by me opening the glove compartment. But it was maybe one of the scariest moments that I had in my life where I felt that there was a possibility the officer could have shot Courtney or myself that we were sitting in the front seat. And my brother and Junie, uh, other soccer players that we, we played soccer with in high school, were, were terrified. They're like, please, please. And we were shaking up. And the officer had his gun. He called for backup. And what's interesting to do, what happened in that moment was another officer arrived that knew, that knew my mother and the officer approached the officer that stopped us. Hey, why you stopped us? It was a routine stop. And, and then he, he, he said, no, I, I know these kids they are they're, they're, they're fine. Uh, I seen them, I seen them before in the neighborhood. So he, he, he vouched for us and we got, we got, we, we left and we didn't really talk about it until Courtney and I spoke last week because he was protesting every single day in Seattle. And, and we talked about that. And he said to me, Omar, don't you, do you remember that day? I was like, yeah, I remember it very vividly. And he said, yeah, you know what's crazy? We thought that was normal. And I was like, yeah, like, I thought that that was just how you interacted with police. And ever since then, when I get stopped by, by police, I'm, I, am, I am a little scared. And just because I'm, I'm still reliving those moments. Thank you for sharing that. And unfortunately it does at times, even without talking about it, because that's not something to talk about with the fellas, you know, something that's just so traumatic in a way for you, because there was a chance that I was not even able to see you right now had something happened. And unfortunately it happens all too often, especially with the aftermath being death. And we have witnessed that and heard about that way too many times. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank you for sharing for yeah. sharing that. Okay. Um, Omar, in what ways have you seen race address in the college arena with student athletes, or how do you think it can be addressed moving forward with the incidents such as, you know, with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and protests coming from those two instances and more? It's very difficult because these students are student athletes and and they they are they do have a voice to a certain extent but the the voice really is the the university the university is the one that leads the agenda for these student athletes and and at times there it is difficult for these student athletes to be able to articulate what they really want to say because when they look in the stands during a football game what do they see? The boosters, the fans are all white. 
that, that when I go to Texas A&M and I go to a football game and there's been times where I've been on the field and I look around and I say, wow, like majority three, four of the individuals here in this stadium, one of the largest stadiums in the world, 102,000 people are white. And not to say the white individuals don't understand the struggle of the majority of the team, which is three fourths African American, but how do you articulate what you're experiencing or feeling when the demographic doesn't represent who you are? So it is very difficult. It is very difficult to have a voice. And the best way to do that is as consultants to support those student athletes and to provide them with opportunities to voice what they're feeling in other ways. But it's very difficult because you're going against the political system. The political system is not set up for the athlete to say, hey, I have something to say. It doesn't happen like that. And that's just the honest truth. This is the system that we're in. We're in a political system. The political system is created on, on a system which favors those individuals with power. And the individuals with power are majority white males in 60, 70 plus who are making these decisions in policy for these student athletes. So it is very difficult. I think student athletes every single day want to talk, they want to speak up, but how do you speak up when maybe the demographic doesn't provide you with the platform or the platform is not even provided to you? Yeah, Omar, this past week we, we saw and heard Iowa, many former athletes um, talking about how they felt when they'd walk in based on how they were dressed alone, they were targeted by whether it was coaches or fans because they had to basically assimilate to, you know, the culture, which is predominantly white. And I want to ask you, do you, you know, in the NFL right now, we're seeing a lot of people who were kind of denouncing Colin Kaepernick and what he did peacefully protesting. The NFL even issued um, a statement and people coming around saying, you know what, maybe we were wrong. Do you have any hope? that that system, because of the protests that are happening now, may open a platform for students that want to speak up? Or do you think, unfortunately, it's just always gonna be this way? Honestly, it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take the next 30 years for the system to change. And um, I'm thinking the number 2050, because that's when the majority is gonna be, we're gonna be over the 50% of people of color in this country is the prediction during that time. So the majority will be Latinos and, and African-Americans by 2050. That will be the majority. So when the majority is African-American and Latinos in this country, you have to have people of color on your board of directors to be presidents of these universities. You have to have multiple directors, not just one director, but you need to have multiple directors at a university level that are making these decisions for the, re the representation of the student body. Right now, when you look at corporations like Apple, uh, Reddit, Reddit is a great example. Serena Williams' husband, he is giving up his board seat because he understands, and he's a co-founder of Reddit, he doesn't have to give up his board seat, but he's giving up his board seat with the purpose that they hire someone of color to take that seat, specifically a black individual to take that seat. Now, not many individuals will do that because why, what, are you, what are you walking away from? You're walking away from power and resources. This whole game is about power and resources. So when I talk about resources, I'm talking about assets, securities, where all your money's being tied into. So why would someone walk away from that? Why would someone like Roger Goodell walk away from that? Why would someone in that, in that network walk away from that? No one would do that because they don't live it. But thankfully, there are individuals like Serena Williams' husband, husband who has seen his wife be discriminated against on and off the court. And he can say, no, 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 no. I'm going to do something about this now because now, now this is more than an issue. Now this is my problem. Because my, my daughter is a person of color. And if I don't do something about that now, who knows if 20 or 30 years when she's in the workforce, will she even have the same opportunities that she should have been provided to her like other individuals now? I didn't know that about, um, about Reddit. So thank you for sharing that. And you know what you mentioned about 2050, it provides me hope, but it also kind of saddens me that it's going to have to 
unfortunately, possibly take the majority of people that look like you and I to for there to be a seat at the table. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, you even saw it with President Obama. Like, we had President Obama for eight years, and even with for president, we would have hoped. I had hope. I remember in two thousand eight, I had a lot of hope that maybe, man, maybe things would be different. Maybe the country would be generally accepting of people of color. But eight years later, it seems like maybe we stay the same or we gone backwards. So you have to really ask yourself, it doesn't just take one person. It takes a plethora of individuals in different seats, not just in the NCAA or at big, powerful SEC universities like Texas A&M University. It takes multiple people. It takes multiple people, honestly. And, uh, and honestly, I, I remember when I first got here and I understood what that looked like because when I got here, Coach Kevin Sumlin was fired. Uh, with a year left in his contract. And he had, a, he had a solid season, but it gets to a point where, yeah, you're in the SEC, people do lose. People do lose a sense of patience with these coaches. It's understandable. But the way his out scene was treated, I did feel that, for me, from my perspective, and I haven't shared this with anyone, from my perspective, I did feel that there was, he would have been maybe, it would have been different if it was someone that wasn't of color. That was white. That was a white coach. Yeah, but that's just how it is. I mean, most people say it was based on performance, but yeah, like our black coaches are not treating the same. And honestly, the NFL recently, a couple of weeks ago, before the George Floyd murder happened in Minneapolis, the NFL did pass a rule that they had to now interview at least two. Every, anytime they're hiring for a front office position, they have to now interview at least two individuals of color. Right. So before that wasn't a requirement. So imagine, look at, I would encourage everyone, look at the front offices for the NFL, for the NBA. Look who's running those, those different institutions and tell me if that's a reflection of the players on the field. Now, the NBA has been a lot more progressive because they have to be. Because when you look at NBA, you're looking at culture, you're looking at black culture, you're looking at American culture. And guess what? Black culture is cool in white America. So since white, black culture is cool in white America, NBA had to step their game up in the 90s. And we see that a lot with the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, uh, how he progressed the culture and moved it forward. So because of someone like Michael, black culture and music is put on a pedestal, but it's not giving the same treatment for everyone else. Thinking the same things I was going to say the last dance really seemed to highlight why and how black culture really took over you know the NBA and yeah. unfortunately it's, it is the cool thing but it's not unfortunately respected as such and I do believe Omar I would not be surprised if you end up being one of those uh, have one of those seats at the table before 2050 not really leading the charge um, with the experiences that you have had in your life and you only shared one of I imagine um, unfortunately many what is one thing you would like our white friends, colleagues, um, and overall people listening to know more about and maybe gain more awareness of many of the, the knowledge you just spit at us right now? You know, these last couple of weeks, I've been having a lot of conversations with different white individuals who are, what can we do? What can we do? And you have to be about that action, is what I will say. That's what, that's what we will say in the street. We like, you have to be about the action. You can't be about the talk anymore. This, is, this ain't about, I'm going to be more cautious. I'm going to go out and, and, and make sure I donate some money. No, no, you have to be about the action. Like, there's no, there's no more, I'm, I'm going to wait for things to get better. If you are a white individual that are, that's in this situation, living in 2020 right now in America, and you want to do something about this, you, you need to not just be donating your money to different charities and organizations who are promoting this cause, like Campaign Zero, which is a, a organization I'm supporting, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. But you need to be donating your time. So when I mean donating your time is... When something like this happens, you need to make sure you're calling and you're checking in on every single individual of color on your feed, on your phone, on your network. You need to say, look, I'm here for you. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. Just doing that 
just lets everyone else know, hey man, I got your back. You might not uh, like they might you might not never understand what that individual is going through, but just you just saying I got your back. That show of empathy and positive regard towards that individual goes. You can only imagine how far that will go, and that tells that individual, I like I see you and you see me. And then that can you can have a dialogue. You can only have a dialogue with trust. The dialogue doesn't just happen magically. The dialogue happens with time, but well, trust has to be built, and it has to be built with daily action, daily action. So, so yeah, I would encourage not just that, the action, I would encourage you to diversify your group of friends. Look at the individuals that, that you're with. Make an encouragement, make a push to diversify your, group, your, your network. I'm not just saying just people of color in America, but diversify your group from people abroad. From South America to Europe to Australia, have a, a, a united network, a group at the same time. And also educate yourself. Read and listen to different individuals, different scholars on race and ethnicity in America and learn from those individuals. Because there's so much that we don't know, including myself, and I'm learning every single day, but you have to be intentional about your learning. Absolutely. And I, I like that last point you named because it's something that we can all learn. We can continue to learn regardless of who we are. And Trust, like you said, really opens the door. And um, yeah, really from that, you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk too, because when somebody that is white shares that with us, like, hey, I see you, I'm here for you. It lets us know that they're also not somebody that's just gonna tolerate BS that continues to be said or violence against people that look like you or not. Omar, when did you, you know, you, you talk so, so passionately and eloquently and i can tell you are somebody that is about that action and through your visions for the future as well when did you notice yourself making that turn and taking that first step and not just having these thoughts but really pushing for it for not just yourself but everybody around you when i was in new york city i was working at apple and i met a i met an individual it was an older white male Wall Street hedge fund manager, uh, multimillionaire, and he, I was intrigued about his life because he was, he told me about his life. He told me about the privilege he grew up in. He's like, yeah, my, my dad went to Columbia. My brother went to Yale. I went to Columbia. I'm legacy. You know, he's like, the privilege that I have is beyond anything. But with that legacy comes knowledge. Is what he told me and, and that kind of stuck with me and but but that doesn't mean that you're gonna that you're gonna be happy in your life because he told me i was divorced my children i don't have a great relationship with my children because i, I spend my entire time focused on being the best wall street broker in the world but what does that only got me a house in the Hamptons and a yacht and that's it <laughs> so so he, he he was turned to mentor and and mentor specifically youth in harlem in new york city and and he told me the reason why I mentor is because I have a lot of, I have, I'm fortunate and privileged to have an, a lot of knowledge, Omar. And that knowledge can give someone the power to make decisions to better their life. So if you have knowledge, even if it's a little bit of knowledge, you need to give it to other individuals, specifically those individuals who are less fortunate than you are because you are privileged because you did go to school and you're working at this great company. And when he told me that, it touched me. And ever since that moment, I, I started volunteering in New York City. I started doing Class Wish was the name of the organization that I volunteered first. It was a school organization that gave supplies to kids in need that didn't have any school supplies. So I, that was my first volunteer experience. And then I started volunteering in after school programs. I, and this is me after graduating and living in New York City. Uh, I didn't have anything, but I felt that I needed to give my time and Right now, to this day, I'm a big brother to AJ, who just recently graduated. And uh, on Sunday, I was teaching him how to drive a car. And we had to have the conversation about what do you do when, when a cop stops you? And, and yeah, yeah, and I, it, it was kind of like full circle for me that I'm able to give that knowledge and share my experiences with AJ. AJ, who's, who's black, and definitely is a lot more susceptible than me if I ever get, if I ever get stopped by the police. But I needed him to hear that. And he was just very appreciated when we had that conversation. 
but yeah, yeah. Um, it's about giving time. Like I said, it's about giving your time. Shout out to AJ uh, for graduating recently and for having a great big brother. Omar, where can people follow you to and reach out to you as well to increase their knowledge? And because you provide a lot of resources all the time, especially on LinkedIn. Um, I really appreciate your post. Where can people reach out to you or you know learn more? Definitely on LinkedIn. I'm super active on LinkedIn. I am an avid reader. So constantly I'm reflecting on articles or videos that I've watched. So LinkedIn at Omar Figueroa is my LinkedIn. Please reach out to me there and I'll be more than happy to correspond with anyone who's listening to this conversation. And he means it. Um, he's been somebody that's always been there for me for questions I've had ever since we met briefly during my visit at Springfield College five years ago now. And oh, I really appreciate it. I know you are gonna continue to just be somebody up there in sport and also just somebody that's gonna be influential and I can't wait to you know, see your future and continue to follow you. So again, thank you for your time, Omar, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for, for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Take care.